Hi, Evelyn. Hello. 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 I, I could not build it personally. And his wife. He's <laughs> <laughs> been my staff for longer than I can. So I want, I want everybody to say hello, both to Mr. Rupert Neve and, and Evelyn Neve, who is over here. Would you? Hello. 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 <laughs> Thank you. And Rupert, you were actually on the headlines Sunday. Can you get a shot of that? Look at this. <laughs> and I was wearing a different shirt. I do have two. <laughs> you know, you've got two Texas Bolo ties, too. Yes. Well, that was for, because I chose this shirt. <laughs> for, a, for a man from England, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good deal. Two Bolo ties. Absolutely. So um, the, the byline of this headline story is... The 87, I'm going to correct it, the 86 year old star of South by Southwest. Rock star. <laughs> How does that feel? I've Amazing. Given up, I've given up thinking about how it feels. It's, uh, it's just like it was when I was 27, except that I don't have the energy I used to have. Um, we've learned a few things on the way, but. Um, Nothing really feels that different. Well, you are being celebrated far and wide. Right now there's a movie out called Sound City. And uh, the director of that movie is a longtime studio um, aficionado and user of one of your vintage consoles. I believe it's an 8028. And um, that console in, in this movie, let me just talk about the, the times we're living in right now for a minute. That console is one of the stars of that movie. Um, it's probably the star of that movie. Yeah. Um, so many artists passed through that studio and their music came through those electronics that you made. And, um, and now that, that piece of engineering is famous and it's being, uh, it's like a Hollywood star. And um, I, I just think that's remarkable. And of course, being the new owner of this, this 5088 that you created for Blue Rock, um, I couldn't imagine better timing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's very good to be appreciated. Uh, there are many fine designers in the industry. There are many fine products. But unfortunately, um, so often people just take a product for granted. If it works and it works well, that's the way it should be. But every now and then we get signs of appreciation. Somebody says something which gives a lot of encouragement. Now the console that Billy was referring to in the subject of that film uh, was one of many that we manufactured in the old days. And yet of all the many that we manufactured, there's probably only a small handful which actually got recognized as being something special, but they were all special. And uh, I just wanted to make that point. Um, it was great that they made it super special, made, based the film on it, and uh, the only thing that I could have wished is that they had 
found other ways of expressing their superlative appreciation. <laughs> Some of the language used was... Uh, <laughs> 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 anyway. But they were enthusiastic, oh, nonetheless. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got the They're message. They're not articulate. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So there's something wonderful about the, the recapitulation of analog electronics in the world. It's out there. It's, uh, it's on everybody's mind again. And I wondered if you could talk about what the beauty of that word is. What, just um, Some of us are technically minded in this room and online today, and some of us really aren't. But I wondered if, if you could... Um, say in, in language that we could all kind of latch on to a little bit, what is it that analog offers um, really good analog electronics and a console like the one we are sitting with here um, that nothing else can? Analog electronics is like painting a picture. You have an artist, he has a palette of an infinite number of paints, paint brushes, tools of his trade, if you like, which he learns or acquires the skills to manipulate, to produce a picture, a thing of beauty. And you remember the saying, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. That is the case with an analog, with, with a painting, a picture, it's analog. And the same thing goes with sound. Digital is kind of cut and dried, it's very correct, it's very analytical, and it can be very good. Um, but it will never produce the finer nuances that analog does. Furthermore, the current um, standards of digital only allow certain limitations of frequency response and dynamic range and so on. So one is constrained within a certain framework. The picture that the digital people try to paint is very accurate, but it is constrained. Analog, there is no such constraint. With analog, we can and do extend <coughs> the frequency response well above what is traditionally thought of as being the limit of human hearing. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that <coughs> 20,000 cycles per second is thought of as being the limit of high frequencies which humans can perceive or hear. As we get older, we tend to reduce that and it becomes 15,000, 12,000, 10,000, and as you really get old, down to 8,000 or less. But <coughs> Apart from what you are perceiving in analog, you can perceive things that are not actually heard. If um, a person such as myself, I, I have a hearing that goes up to about 12,000, being old. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I can perceive frequencies that go well above that. And younger people will perceive higher frequencies than I can. Now, you don't hear those, but if those frequencies are absent, the picture is incomplete. Digital, it just cuts off at a given frequency limit. Analog doesn't, it goes on. This console, for instance, will go on up to 100,000, not 20,000, will go up faithfully up to 100,000 cycles per second. You don't hear 100,000 cycles per second. <coughs> but there are many musical instruments that have natural harmonics which occur well above 20,000 cycles. And if they're absent, they don't reproduce faithfully. So that's about as far as we can go on the technical aspects of the, of the lecture. But this console, will reproduce faithfully every frequency up to 100,000 which is fed into it from high quality microphones, from high quality analog instruments, 
and um, it just leaves us with one further question. How do we record that? We have all this amazing stuff processed by the Consul, faithfully coming out of the Consul. How do we log it? We log it on super special high quality recording equipment which does go up to very high frequencies. In fact, as high a frequency as we want it to go commercially. And again, it's the commercial limitations, starting at the bottom end with a compact disc, which at least said the better, <laughs> and, uh, um, up to other formats, which do faithfully, can faithfully reproduce these high frequencies. Now I say reproduce, they do reproduce them you don't necessarily hear them, but they are perceptible. And without those high frequencies, the faithfulness of the picture is lost. The integrity of what the artist is producing is absent. Thank you very, very much. I'm sure that inspired about wow. 20 questions from everybody. Wow. One thing that you said to me, um, and let me let me also, if I could, just say one of the d great delights of, of, of uh, Blue Rock right now and my team is that we are getting to have um, some dialogue with you um, roughly once a week um, and I've, I've asked Rupert um, uh, and he's asked me if, if we could um, have some conversation that would really try to codify his design philosophy and, um, and really um, a lifetime of anecdotes, of beautiful stories, and of uh, meaningful contributions to this art form. And I'm telling you, it's one of the great joys for me to be doing that with you. Thank we you. were having this conversation about two weeks ago about, um, about the, uh, um, what it might mean to have an extended frequency response for analog gear and what that might mean to the subtlety of the music that we perceive and he said Billy the whole body is an ear yeah. okay that set me back a little bit <laughs> and your ear might actually not not show that it registers past 12,000 but the whole body is getting what this music is up to up, up, way above that I love that yes the same or very similar uh, body cells that um, are present in the hearing canals in your ears are present in other parts of the body as well. So there is justification for saying that the whole body is in fact an extension of the hearing. And it's the same sort of thing with sight. I'm no expert on, on sight, but uh, a person who is blind can sense a whole lot of things going on in their environment without being able to see. Mm. And it's somewhat similar to that. You can sense what's going on in the audio world without necessarily hearing it through the ears. Of course, the ears are the principal channels through which you do hear. So a couple of things now. Um, I will, uh, let me take you back. Some of you um, are intimately familiar with Rupert's story and his contributions. Some of you may be wondering, well, just what was that? Um, they talk about <laughs> Mr. Neve as being the father of modern recording. Um, I think I said to the paper the other day that he was the author of the apparatus that that facilitated the entire British invasion, <laughs> which I think is not an understatement. The consul, the idea of it, um, was not in existence before the, I guess, right at the beginning of the 60s. And um, you were out of the war, you had um, run a... a uh, a little truck, you bought an ambulance from a, an old retired ambulance from the military, yeah. and you and, and Evelyn set up a little business that would make recordings on disc for ensembles around England. 
and you tried to convince her father that that was a legitimate thing to do. And <laughs> this is before we married, and uh, <laughs> I had to demonstrate that I was going to be able to keep her in the manner to which she had been accustomed. <laughs> and when we talked about it, and he wanted me to explain what sound recording is, and he said, well, why would I want to record, why do you want to record your voice? I said, no, I don't want to record my voice, but might want to record yours, and there are many people, fortunately, who do want their voices and their music recorded. And he said, well, how much would that cost? Well, we, I named a price, and I can't remember the, the numbers, but of course, to make an individual recording is not a cheap thing. And I mentioned a price. And he said, this is ridiculous. I can go down to the record store and I can buy a record for a fraction of that price. I said, fine, you, ought, you, you make a recording of, of your singing and order 10,000 copies and I will meet that price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> had no concept of the magnitudes and the commercial aspect of the thing. But when we had finished that interview, he was still very doubtful. And he said, you know, my boy, because I was a boy at that time, um, I think you'd better go and get a proper job. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened, as I understand it, was that Rupert decided to work for a transformer manufacturer. And he was thrust into a role in which he was designing better transformers, which has really been one of the keys to your contribution. There are... Um, delicate transitions that happen at every stage of an audio the way it gets from point A to B from the microphone all the way down to the to the uh, final product and in Rupert's designs invariably there are these beautiful transformers that take it to the next stage and that's one thing that he has has brought to the world that um, he has uncanny talent for and I'm, I'm just sure it's a lot of intuition as well as a lot of uh, training in science. Um, and then, uh, not, I guess from that point, if you want to read about his life, you will find that he did um, audio for, for Winston Churchill. You will find then, at, at the establishment in the early 60s of the Neve Electronics Company, that um, he began to make consoles for George Martin of the Beatles, that the entire British pop music wave began to come to Rupert and request these multi-channel uh, devices to be able to record in the new way. And so the timing was amazing and the talent was amazing. Um, so um, now we've come all the way to 2013 and one of the award-winning um, designs from about three years ago at the NAM show was this 5088 console behind me. And you keep winning these awards. <laughs> Just came back last month with two more. Um, and so I'm thrilled about that. And uh, I, I guess I just want to ask you for all of us, at 86, how do you stay in the game? How do you stay vital? How do you... Uh, what keeps you dreaming big? Well, I'm in the very privileged position of being able to dream and of having a superb staff of design engineers who are as enthusiastic as myself and who will take an idea and run with it and will produce circuits that implement those dreams, if you like. Um, the basic concepts, the ideas, the dreams um, originally were mine. Now we've got a really first-class team of people without whom there wouldn't be a console, there wouldn't be any of these outboard equipments, uh, because they are the people who do the hard work and turn the dream into a piece of mm. hardware. And using the same principles, using the transformer designs and many other aspects of design, they build these into the equipment and uh, enable us as a company to produce equipment which is uh, highly satisfying, shall we say.
satisfying, I believe, to them as it is to me. Well, Rupert Nave, um, uh, somebody tell me how we're doing on time. Do we have time for a little cues? It's 1.50? Okay, good. Sorry, online, you can't ask questions today. We'll, we'll get that top technology up and going soon. <coughs> but does anybody in the room have a question for Mr. Neve? Yes, sir. One of the things, one of the projects we're doing for our museum is asking people of significance, what did they think and what was it recorded on the first time they heard themselves recorded? And when was it? Oh. Okay, so you're asking what, what was the technology when you heard yourself recorded? When he first, first heard time? himself and what was it recorded? And what did he think of hearing himself? I can't recall that I ever heard myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my job is to record other people. Not <laughs> there is nothing special about my voice or I don't play any musical instruments or anything. But uh, the, if we translate that question into what other people are doing or were doing, um, I go back to the days even before disc recording <coughs> wire recorders, wow. where I was shown a wire recorder, which is a most horrible piece of equipment, <laughs> <laughs> but it was used uh, during World War II, wow. and uh, there was also a tape machine which used steel tape during World War II. Um, the sound quality was really quite abysmally bad, and when you hear something that's as bad as that, you feel you really ought to try and improve it. Um, moving on to the point where um, Evelyn and I set up this little business, that was recording on 78 RPM disc. I'm sure you're all aware in the recent past we've had LPs long playing records which revolve at 33 and a third revolutions per minute. And so the 78 was the thing which preceded that, a 78 RPM 12 inch recording would last for four and a half minutes, a 10 inch recording would last for three and a half minutes, and you had to be darn sure that your recording was going to fit within that time scale. Um, so you were watching the music sheets, you were listening and hoping that your uh, artist wasn't going to overstep the four and a half minutes, mm -hmm. or the cutting head would be cutting into the paper label in the center of the disc, <laughs> which was not funny. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Another question? Hans, uh, yes, sir. What, how do you see the future of, of recording in a, in a world that is basically dominated by digital distribution and MP3s? Um, can you dream a future in which the analog and the quality of the music recording comes back? I think it is already coming back to a large extent. Um, the, uh, the public, if we can find the, the people out there who are interested, um, are becoming more and more aware of quality, sound quality. And the sort of thing I've been talking about, the ability to perceive frequencies which are well above normal audibility, isn't the only thing that you can perceive. Um, and people are beginning to realize that those attributes are available on disk. The, the old uh, 33 and a third is actually coming back and uh, it's a very good medium of distribution, it always was. Um, it's much less, in some senses, it's much less robust than digital. It's, you can't reproduce it in the same way that you can put a digital sound through a computer and log it onto your hard disk and reproduce it as many times as you like. And it, it can emerge from your computer as a disc or as a chip or as a card or many different forms um, but its quality is up to you. you you decide the standard that you want it to come out of the uh, computer on um, and when you listen and if you have the opportunity of comparing what comes out of your computer um, or indeed out of a, even a high quality digital recorder 
with what has been logged, analog path all the way onto a disk. Um, it doesn't take really magic ears to perceive that difference and to want the true analog sound. There are other aspects as well. Uh, I'm in danger of stepping into a long dissertation here, but the quality of sound affects mood. The actual mood of the listener is governed to a large expense, extent by what you're perceiving. I nearly said hearing, it's not necessarily hearing, it's your perception. And if those elements that I've talked about are absent from the sound that you're perceiving, you start to feel frustrated, you start to feel dissatisfied. It's very hard to define this in words, but that's the sort of thing that happens, and so you can only generalize and say it affects your mood. Sooner or later, a listener will realize that it's his or her mood which is being affected. And you don't want to live with something that's going to give you a kind of negative mood, make you cross and bitchy with your family and all the rest of it. You want something that is beautiful and will help you to enjoy life not hate it. Thank you. That's Thank what you so we're talking about. Yeah. 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 So let it be. Well, um, I want to repeat something you just said about two minutes ago. And I just want to notice it for myself and maybe for anybody else. When you see something abysmal in the world, it makes you want to make it better. Some of us are like that. There's my little sermon to myself and to you. You see something abysmal in the world, do something about it. <laughs> I'm so grateful to you, Mr. Neve, that you are that kind of guy. And it's a, it's a great privilege for my team and for our dream to be able to match up with yours at this time in your life. And um, it's, it's such a great joy to be, um, uh, to be able to now use some of the tools that your passions have brought to bear in the world. Um, and our story and, and yours, we're both in this little town of Wimberley together. Yeah. Who could have planned that? <laughs> we didn't know you were here when, when Dodie and I arrived, and so that was a great, uh, a, a great bit of kismet. Um, and I feel very humbled and privileged by that. Um, so we want to thank you for um, all that you've done for Blue Rock and, and for music. Well, thank you, Billy, for all the support you've given us and the way in which we've been able to use you, your people, your facilities here as a shop window, as a testing ground very often for new designs. Thank you. Our privilege. Well, okay, so the moment has come. <laughs> we need to find a, a big permanent, I mean permanent. <laughs> there's the magnum and there's the only super giant. <laughs> Um, do you want to test those out? Yeah, we're going to test them out. Okay, something. get a pad there, Charlie. <coughs> do you have a bottle of rubbing alcohol or something of that sort? Oh. Of in case we make a mistake and that right to. Oh, a little alcohol <laughs> towel. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's not. And you want a date on it? Yes. Oh, so so March 16th, 2013. I just March. <laughs> uh, are you good? You happy with it? I love So wake me in the morning Or I see my baby And I need a few of sunlight On my face I believe this any longer I'm gonna fade away It's time to say goodbye And all my you guys have a wonderful day at Blue Rock. Thank you for helping us celebrate. Get a tamale. Talk to Mr. Neve. Um, we'll start the live stage out here in the in the Texas room at 2:30, and I think it's already going out on the patio. So have fun.
Absolutely. Really? Close together. Close together. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah, man. Oh, uh, y'all done with stuff by now? Or? No, I got